Okay, we are recording, so it's on the top of the hour here, so I might begin. Welcome everybody to uh, this next session uh, for Tuesday's proceedings of the HSN. I always have to do the little kind of letter math in my head when I'm saying the acronym. And we have three uh, papers that are going to be presented today. I'll introduce each person before their presentation. And there's a little unadvertised change. Uh, Izu Inwankwo could not join uh, in real time with us. So he instead sent a recording, which um, I will play that first. I think that makes sense and let our live presenters uh, present after that. So we, the discussion flows on a little more naturally. So Izul Inwankwo is a research fellow at the Institute for Anthropology and African Studies at the Johannes Gutenberg University of Mainz, Germany, working in the project SEDITRA, which stands for Cultural Entrepreneurship and Digital Transformation in Africa and Asia. His research interests revolve around African and African diaspora popular culture and performance. He is a recipient of the African Humanities Program Dissertation Completion Award and postdoctoral fellowships in 2012 and 2014. Nguanko is also Iso Lomso Postdoctoral Fellow of the Stellenbosch Institute for Advanced Studies in Stellenbosch, University of South Africa, and a George Forster Postdoctoral Fellow of the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation, Germany. His publications include the Igbo language translation of Chinua Achibe's Things Fall Apart, entitled Ihe Agasa. Others are Yabbing and Wording, the Artistry of Nigerian Stand-Up Comedy, the edited volume Stand-Up Comedy in Africa, Humor in Popular Languages and Media, and the co-authored work Humor and Politics in Africa, Beyond Resistance, which is coming out this year, if it is not already out. I will now play Isu's presentation. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Isu Nguanko, and I'm happy to be here at this conference. Uh, my, the title of my presentation is African Stand-Up Humor in Transcultural Sites how laughter travels across difference. In this paper, I hope to speak uh, specifically about how uh, humor travels, especially from the African continent to other places. Uh, I want to speak about how African people, comedians in the West with African background, use stand-up comedy to speak about their encounters and to speak about themselves and their experiences and their background, and also to speak about Africa and African peoples in the uh, sites where they perform. So first of all, I'd like to talk about humor, but specifically to speak about uh, what the pers academic perspectives on humor have been. Generally, they have been classified into two broad categories the cognitive and the sociological perspectives. So without dwelling on this uh, cognitive perspectives, which have to do with psychological and neurological processes and how uh, jokes uh, uh, stimulate laughter and the th things pertaining to incongruity, surprise and resolution, I'm more interested in the sociological perspective, which is to look at the social and cultural aspects of humor, uh, how jokes serve as social commentary, and how jokes reflect power dynamics, cultural values, and social norms on the one hand, and on the other hand, how jokes also subvert and re either subvert or reinforce these uh, power dynamics and cultural values, social norms that we find in this society. So, so in this slide, uh, to look at stand-up comedy and to define it as something that reveals a culture's fears, values, hopes, and most profoundly our sins. This is pretty clear because it doesn't show us the good side, even though we are amused, or even though uh, it tries to make us laugh, it does that through showing us the underside of our existence. And the other definition given by Tafoya also says that stand-up comedy leans towards revealing that which is unpleasant and even visceral 
angry and profane, turning the floor over to the to observations and commentaries that grow out of negativity, disgust, and carnal appetites. So, in so many ways, most of the things that we see through joke uh, telling are things that are unpleasant, things that ordinarily would make somebody cringe. And these are things that comedy thrives on. And so, for this reason, stand up comedy and humor are closely related. And uh, stand up comedians use jokes, pawns, satire, and other devices to make, audience, to make audiences laugh. And uh, stand up comedy is a way of creating and sharing humor with an audience, and it allows uh, comedians to express their thoughts, observations, and perspectives on the world through a lens of comedy and for audiences to express these ideas in a fun, fun and entertaining way. So we see these bad sides of our existence. Uh, they're presented to us, but they're presented in ways that we are amused rather than uh, irritated by them. That's, that's the work that stand-up comedy does. And uh, peculiarly, there are things that are very peculiar to, to, to stand-up comedy the demands that stand-up comedy makes on com comedians. The first one is that stand-up comedians are judged almost solely by the amount of laughter they elicit. So this is something that is peculiar to stand-up comedy because uh, it, it's, the, it's the way or the amount of laughter that we're able to generate that determines how successful or otherwise that the performance is. Then the next one is that comedians are directly involved in their art. Novelists create characters to represent ideas and visions, but comedians, whatever they say, because they are present in their art, it does appear sometimes as if what they are saying uh, is their opinion. So th it's very important to, to, to look at these backgrounds. See, they are in their art, a sculptor makes uh, something and puts it somewhere and is not there. A painter does the same. The novelist writes the work and moves away from it. Most artists move away from their, uh, from their art. Uh, musicians make their songs and sometimes you don't see them in the songs. But comedians go into performances as themselves. So in that way, they are not uh, well insulated from their art. So oftentimes what they say can be mistaken as their personal opinions when they are not. Then they produce new jokes for every every performance. Now this is not exactly true. It's not that they have to produce new jokes. They often repeat jokes, but these repeated jokes are done in such a way that they are presented innovatively in every uh, every performance. So when you go through different performances, you find out that they alter their presentations. Uh, in line with their own reading of audience response. And it should be noted at this point that any comedian who repeats jokes, who maybe for years tells the same joke all the time, will definitely fall out of favor. The reason is because jokes do not elicit the same amount of laughter or, or funniness in the same audience at every uh, every time it's had. So if you read a novel, people go back to read novels 10 times, watch movies 5, 10 times, and do other things repeatedly, put music on replay, but jokes do not serve the same fun, they do not work the same way. So oftentimes you find people want to hear new jokes because it's the suspense that actually stimulates laughter. Uh, then they must necessarily offend in order to amuse. This is very basic. This is because it tells about things that are not nice about society. We find out that the things they tell us would ordinarily offend us, but they tell it in ways that they should amuse. And then they have the onerous task of making humanity laugh at itself. So we, 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 they tell us our bad side and force us to laugh at ourselves. This is not an easy thing to do. People ordinarily do not find it funny or easy to take criticism, let alone when you put it in a way that actually appears to mock them. That this is not a very easy thing. So they must be adept at timing. They need to be brief in their setup. They don't have to tell a long, a long stories like I'm doing presently. They have to make it as short as possible in order to, 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 to get to the audience. Because the longer it takes to get to the, to the, uh, to the punchline, the, the, the more you lose the attention of the of the, of the audience. They have to create familiarity with the audience. You see how paradoxical it is. 
that you on the one side have to irritate people or tell them things that are offensive in order to amuse them and at the same time you have to cut their 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 their, their, their compliance cut their friendliness cut a kind of relationship with strangers total strangers it's easier to make family and friends laugh than it is to make it a whole full of total strangers from disparate backgrounds so the it's it's a very tedious work they do they must be spontaneous this is most important because stand-up comedy is mostly a live performance and they have to be spontaneous which means they have to respond on their feet they they, they sometimes they come with a script and end up going off script entirely and this is what when it comes to timing you know this is linked to timing you have to respond to what the audience is doing at every point in time respond to the atmosphere respond to the dynamics of the performance to be able to carry along you don't have to stick to your script when you're already up there on stage and uh, another important thing is that they have to render successive jokes in tandem with audience response this is very important they tell jokes that are not related but they have to link them in such a way that there is a semblance of a, uh, of a kind of organic relationship between the things. It's like one long plot, but again, it's made up of disparate tales, which they put together in order to make it work for them. And this is important. So this is looking at the basic things that are some of the basic things that uh, stand-up comedy demands, uh, or the basic demands that stand-up comedy makes uh, on, on performers. And then uh, in the next slide, so we find that on the African continent, we find such a unique diversity, multiple influences, and continue, uh, continual back and forth borrowings in terms of stand up comedy, which has become quite popular on the continent for four major reasons uh, liberalization of the media. Uh, uh, the coming of democracy, multi-party and multi-racial uh, democracies in different parts of the continent, which meant that people, uh, we are the governments, we are more uh, tolerant. And then uh, the liberalization of the media, the social media also afforded people the opportunity to be able to get out there, giving less. Uh, uh, control from the government. And then we find that the economy itself becoming so bad in different places serve as raw materials which comedians use for their work. And you find that a lot of people, because of problems, economic problems, because of the un unemployment in so many nations and the inability to make ends meet, people have gone into humor uh, productions to be able to make ends Then the continent itself has a uh, diverse and rich in cultural differences uh, as ethnic uh, diversity, linguistic diversity. We find that, that we have one of the most uh, di people dispersal across the world, uh, histor historical and contemporary migrations. And we find people all over. There's internal conflicts and divisions. And there are measures of traditional and received art forms. You find the, that there are ways people are using traditional uh, performances to counter Western hegemony and discrimination. And then you find this common celebration or uh, celebration of common heritage through art and uniqueness in jokes and humor. Deployment of punch up jokes, very important because uh, these comedians uh, find ways to appropriate uh, historical factors in using jokes that would ordinarily be considered uh, politically incorrect. Now, uh, on the next slide, I'd like to uh, so on the next five slides, I'll just introduce us to five people. Uh, Gina Yashari, who is US-based British uh, comedian of Nigerian parentage. Then we have Sama Hindi, who is uh, non-US-based, but was born Canadian of Egyptian parentage. Then we have uh, Arthur Simeon, who was born in Uganda, but now performs and lives and performs in Canada. <laughs> and then Trevor Noah, who is quite popular, the most popular of the lot, I guess, who was born South African, now lives in the US, uh, recently left The Daily Show in the US. And then Usila Carlson, who was born South African also, and who presently lives in New Zealand and performs in, in the area, New Zealand and Australia and across the world. 
so here we find all of them put together so uh, I'll just present them Jinayashiri present herself I think this is a statement she made which is important for me she said I am four out of the six things Trump hates black gay female immigrant and then the next person Sama Hindi said she was born on 9-11 that, that's her birth date not in 2001 but she was born on 9-11 which is significant and which she brings to her jokes giving her own identity she said I get offended when men stop objectifying me I've been in the hijab for 22 years so she is Muslim and she recently using her word transitioned out of out of the hijab and uh, she does jokes that talk about these things uh, uses uh, kind of dialectical perspectives uh, uh, to aggressively talk about the, the conflict being an African immigrant and being Muslim and also being Canadian so she talks about these things and then at Simeon said uh, uses his jokes to counter stereotypes against Africans and one of the sarcastic jokes he talked about that is about convincing a girl a Canadian girl that uh, he came with a lion from Africa and this is his way of countering the idea that Africa is a place where wild animals run free and so he he talks about these things an interesting thing here is that he said she believed me which means the lady believed that he actually came with a lion to Africa so you find this kind of jokes uh, with him and it also speaks a lot about his identity and how he uses uh, that to counter stereotypes about Africa and Africans and then Trevor Noah has a background from Apartheid Africa, uh, South Africa where he was born when he was born he is of mixed parentage his father is Swiss his mother South African and he was he said he was born a crime because when he was born it was illegal in his country for uh, white people to have any form of relationship with black people so he considers himself to have been born a crime and it also influences how he speaks about racism and how he talks about the fallout of colonialism and all forms of marginalization we find in today's world it's like housing was born in south africa and she moved to uh, to New Zealand and she talks about in this joke uh, that I just put the quotation there that she's a happy fatty because I know I am fat and I know the reason for it I grew up in Africa and it's the fault of the West because of the all the rejected food that they sent to Africa so this is a sarcastic way of speaking about how people think that it's the aids from the West or the food they send from the West that feed Africa and it also takes off from the idea that Africa is a poor hungry continent where animals run free and uh, you, you find all these kind of jokes in, in, in their presentations so what do all these mean time and I'll just conclude by saying that African comedians bring unique perspectives and experiences to the world of comedy they often draw upon their cultural heritage and immigrant experiences to create humor that is relatable to a diverse range of audiences their contributions can include a lot of things their contributions can include uh, challenging stereotypes it can also include representing underrepresented groups also includes creating more inclusivity and cultural diversity and fostering greater understanding across cultural uh, differences and they also speak about things commit other comedians comedians with other backgrounds cannot speak about there are things they can speak about that others cannot speak about and this is very important because when others say those things it, they, it becomes politically incorrect and then they reinscribe Africa, write, rewrite Africa, to talk about it differently from the misrepresentations of the past. They bring you unique perspectives and experiences, and they draw on cultural heritage and immigrant experiences to speak about what goes on in the society. They are the ones experiencing some of these marginalizations, and they're able to speak about them quite appropriately. And then they create humor that relates to a diverse range uh, because if in intercultural spaces you have to take cognizance of these differences to be able to navigate the differences and then uh, lastly but not the least they speak about racism and discrimination so these things are interrelated and I have to say at this point that they take off 
from the diversity or diversity in, in the continent itself with over 2,000 different linguistic groups and different, uh, over 54 nations, they take out from this diversity that we, or heterogeneity that we find on the continent itself. And it's from there that they also develop this kind of the ability, the ability to navigate these differences. I set out to write this paper about uh, to pinpoint the differences you know, to give jokes that they give in different contexts, context, where they use the same material in different contexts to show how they adapt their performances to different audiences. I will do that in the full paper. But for now, I just pointed out the differences that you can find and the ability with the differences you can find on the continent. Uh, if you go back to the slide about uh, the, the, all the comedians put together, uh, where the five comedians are, yeah, because uh, so if we come back here, you discover that uh, the differences here. This is this is just a, this is just a, a sample of the kind of differences you find. And if I will just use Sama Hindi for instance, who is Muslim, oftentimes Africa is seen as a black continent, but there are people who are not black. There are people who are of mixed uh, cultural backgrounds or mixed ethnicity. You can find a uh, black housing who was born in South Africa, who is not black, and you find Sama Hindi, who is also not black. So uh, people like Trevor Noah in Australia, there's a there's a comedian Matt Okine, who uh, has um, Okina Okin, I don't know how it's pronounced, who uh, has a Ghanaian father, and he also makes these jokes about uh, that side of him even though he was born in australia even though he grew up in australia he talks about this so one thing that is significant in their performances is that they use their africanness to underscore and underline their difference and that gives them the ability and the capacity to speak about things that other comedians cannot speak about they can speak about slavery, they can skip to speak, speak about colonization, they can speak about things in ways that other comedians cannot. So in the flooded space of Western comedy scene, where you find people from different backgrounds, people with African background, even those who have little or no uh, lived experience of the continent itself, find themselves using that background to their advantage, to be able to characterize themselves in particular ways, to present themselves and speak about them, uh, certain issues the way they, they, are, they, can, they alone can be allowed to do. They use accents, they use uh, speech patterns, they use uh, mannerisms, they use dance steps and different manner of things that associate them with the continent to speak about this. And there are limitations. There are certain things that uh, Arthur Simeon, for instance, can speak about that Uzla Kausen cannot speak about. There are things like uh, Trevor Noah and Uzla Kausen are from South Africa. There are instances in the paper itself where they, uh, that I'm writing where they are they speak about different things. They, for instance, do not speak about the appetite experience in the same way. And so you find these differences in the way they speak and they bring this to the world stage. And I think uh, this is quite important. And so my, uh, on a final note, I'd like to close by saying that, that within intercultural spaces, when humor travels, the identities of the people bearing the humor or the people who are bearing the jokes matter in both how the jokes are perceived by the audience, how they are presented, and they also inform everyone involved in terms of the historical and the sociological relationships that you find within this. So when the backgrounds differ or when they are counter to expectations, those jokes can be considered offensive. But when the person bearing the joke has the expected identities uh, for bearing such jokes, offense is mitigated. Thank you so very much for listening. Okay, uh, uh, if uh, future Izu is listening to this uh, recording, Thank you so much for your uh, presentations. Not only are we split in space by Zoom, but now in time by this uh, recorded presentation, which is kind of fun. Uh, I will, Stephen, if you want to perhaps uh, try sharing your screen, uh, Izu's 
presentation reminded me of a friend who did a season in Canada in the ski fields and convinced some Americans that kangaroos delivered our mail. Uh, so this is the uh, you know transcultural humor I think that um, Izu was getting at. So Stephen, looks like your screen is working. So I shall introduce you. Stephen <laughs> Folden is a Birmingham-born Irishman living and working in Germany for the Pixida Group, where he coaches the Agile Framework. He has been involved with technology and leadership for over 20 years and is also an ex-chairman of the Lewis Carroll Society. In his career, he observed the similarities between Alice in Wonderland and modern business behavior, leading him to present Lewis Carroll and his influence on management thinking at a Lewis Carroll conference. The slightly updated title for today's talk is Humor Works, a vital characteristic for successful leaders with examples from literature. Stephen, please go ahead. Okay. Um, my name is Stephen Folan, and I work for Pixida GmbH as a project consultant and a recent chairman until last year of the... Oh, Like, is that working okay? The two roles aren't incompatible, as I'll explain in my talk. Um, it's a big theme, and I'll focus on how I've used it myself in the project management over the last 20 years, as I'm definitely someone who sort of learns by doing. Um, and I'll focus in this case on include works by Carol and Mark Twain and how their stories from 150 years ago link humor to business context for anyone leading a team today. So, so few books have leadership with humor and the typical characteristics that a leader needs are shown on this slide. But one of my contentions is that the complete leader needs to be held together or supported by a sense of humor. Each person will develop their own style of humor based on their tastes and preferences. My interests are in art, book, films, theater, as an inspiration. And I extract vivid examples from that so that other people can remember. Um, and I'll discuss two of the sources, Lewis Carroll and Mark Twain, but there are many others that you know, I'd like to use sometimes, such as Jonathan Swift, Marx Brothers, W.C. Field and Mel Brooks, that I draw from sometimes depending on the audience. Um, so this bit is the, the scientific part where I propose a good categorization of traditional leadership works like this. Um, Kurt Lewin is the is an acknowledged father of social psychology, and he came up with these categorizations. So with the laissez-faire leadership, it allows group members total freedom. Um, laissez-faire leaders do not need to participate in decision-making process and really offer opinions. Authoritarian means that the leader has now got full power, and these people tell groups what to do and expect the group members to execute. Democratic leadership balances decision-making responsibility between the group and the leader. Democratic leaders tend to actively participate in discussions, but also make sure to listen to the views of others. There is no right or wrong leadership style. All are useful depending on the situation, the environment, the company, and the context. If you need quick decision-making, autocratic is good. If you want group commitment, then democratic approach works. And if the team is full of knowledgeable, motivated people, you get out of the way and you adopt a less safe fair attitude. In earlier days, I would have used all three of these as a sort of leadership stew and tried to get to less safe fair as soon as I could. However, today, the servant leader approach reflects the way that we work. And it works well with teams that are geographically dispersed, with different cultures, styles, and levels of experience. Often my role is to coach them and just to remove the obstacles and stop them from being successful. Technology like Zoom and Teams allow sharing, but what tends to happen is once the meeting is over, there is often a lack of true collaboration, cohesion within the team, and they may revert to their virtual silo or safe behavior, which is why I think that humor is important to generate a connection with and across the people we're working with who may feel disengaged or stressed. On this slide, it really um, summarizes the benefits of humor. You know, the scientific evidence that supports it, um, that having humor in a work environment helps everybody 
from a health and a behavioural perspective. I mean, I was a young project manager and we were always focused on the plan and who was the best planner. However, on reflection, a lot of the successes that I had were through the behavioural benefits of humour when my team came up with creative options to solve crises or bounce back from the regular setbacks that we would face on any piece of work that was more than a month long and had got any value. Uh, I mean, and I remember early on that one time when I delivered a significant piece of work, feedback from the, the project the owner, the client, was that Stephen has a good sense of humour, and I was crushed, as I wanted to be told what a brilliant planner I was. Much later, and I mean 10 years later, I realised that this was quite insightful, and instead of focusing so much on the methodologies and frameworks that people do, it was actually a strength that should be kept in my toolbox, because it gave me the additional benefits that I've outlined, um, but I needed to be avoided being regarded as frivolous or flippant, uh, which takes trial and error, like a, like a comedian learning his trade. Um, and humour is great, a great tool for leaders in the new, this new world of hybrid working. Face-to-face um, -face meetings can establish rapport quickly and identify any hotspots in a working relationship. Um, you can develop a quick bond between the you know, between the leader and the team and team members amongst themselves. The, it's also a form of emotional radar where you can tell by the responses, you know, where you are in the relationship with the team and navigate thoughtfully going forward. It supports people getting into a flow state by providing a sense of relaxed playfulness and lightening the mood. When people are feeling relaxed and engaged, they're more likely to become fully immersed in an activity and do well with less effort. In addition, laughter has been shown to have a number of, as it says here, beneficial effects on the body and mind, you know, including increasing endorphins, reducing cortisol levels, which create a more positive um, experience. I mean, it also means making yourself vulnerable so that any attempts that you have at humour can be rejected, but that can be funny too. In a recent training session, and I'm working in Germany now, the topic was high performing teams. Uh, that one of the comments made was that I wouldn't use the German national football team as an example. And I did get some smiles and some people don't like football in Germany anyway. Um, and in addition to the, the work focus on technology and management, I have an interest in culture, literature, films, theatre, music. I use as examples of teamwork, creativity and initiative. And I compare and contrast with modern day technology trends, entrepreneurs or leaders. There are so many vivid examples that can be used to make people aware there are other possibilities of thinking and ways of doing things. And so I'll just use a few examples from Carol Twain and others. But if you've got other ideas or other examples, feel free to share them. Okay, you know, the learning never stops. So, I mean, why they, I mean, here, as I was just saying, it pulls them out of the common frame of reference. It learn about the common team culture, and there's a lot of material, you know, with, with, particularly with Twain and with, um, and with Carol. I'll start off with a little, uh, you know, a quote here to show that um, it sounds very strange at the start using these guys from 150 years ago, but um, reading through the, the business material, you, you'll find quotes like this, you know, and I'm a big fan of Peter Drucker's effective executive as, uh, you know, it's, it's fantastic in English, and actually, if I'm looking at other languages, its simplicity is really good. But here we have um, somebody suggesting that things have changed so much that Lewis Carroll's through the looking glass should be used. And my quick take on Carroll and Twain is that the Alice stories provide a humorous perspective on potentially dysfunctional organizations and behavior that can develop over time. Um, Twain's The Connecticut Yankee in the Court of King Arthur gives us a psychology of someone who is certainly has all the answers. And it wasn't a very popular book at the time because it poked fun of the idea that the American way was better than the old European way. E.g. the Silicon Valley, I mean, today we'd say that the Silicon Valley model should be replicated across Europe. Um, these stories have protagonists who find themselves thrown into a system that they do not understand, they're unfamiliar with, and they do their best. Um, and this is a very familiar feeling for people nowadays. Carol is funny because the Alice stories um, contain lots of visual jokes, such as people playing croquet with flamingos, as mallets, uh, and live hedgehogs as the, the ball. 
and it's combined with wordplay and sometimes it combines both for example the bread and butterfly is a word or the court scene there is a court scene where the queen of hearts um, shouts sentence first verdict afterwards um, and here's another example the expression the red queen syndrome turns up frequently if you google it on the internet in technology banking and everything as a way of expressing the problems we have in remaining up to date and you know and i've given an example there that it's used in business competitive um, theory um, twain's humor highlights the disparity we have between what we expect and what might, what might happen unlike um, carol he's a moralist he's got a soft spot for an opportunist such as um, we'll talk about Hank Morgan and Merlin in Camelot. Um, and he accepts that people need to bend the rules or ignore them to make progress. In today's more bureaucratic world, he would say it is better to ask for forgiveness than to ask for permission. And, and there are even books nowadays using this as a, as a theme, such as move fast and break things, which is a byword for the work of Amazon, Facebook and Google. These stories are great for pointing out in a non-threatening way that strange behavior in organizations has been around for a long time. You know, we read these stories as children and we think that there is no way that we would indulge in such behavior, you know, or, or would we? You know, we can laugh about the ridic ridiculous nature of the stories, but not, and, and also not look beyond the entertainment that they provide. So, I mean, if I look at say Lewis Carroll, his two books are a great resource for organizations and institutions. You know, he captured in these stories a lot of the behavior that he observed while teaching at Oxford University um, and that I observed working at KPMG with clients. Carol is quoted everywhere from the US Supreme Court, Winston Churchill, up to the modern day when really is there a week that goes past when there's not a reference to Wonderland or a looking glass world in the news media. You know, in my opinion, He's a big influence on management concerning the rituals of large organizations, such as we see here, you know, the committee meeting um, or the corporate away day or even team bonding exercises. We absorb the Alice stories as children by our parents read them to us, books, films, theater, cartoons, and we store the ideas in our brains for years. Um, later, we might find ourselves on a committee or a large meeting and perhaps our inner hatter March Hare or Queen of Hearts is displayed. You now, people might identify these traits in other colleagues as Carolian archetypes, but really, will they confess to being a capricious Queen of Hearts or a threatening hatter? And like I said, some of um, Carol's paradoxes in her mainstream business thinking, such as the Red Queen um, reference, um, where you need to run twice as fast if you want to get anywhere. Um, these Alice stories are cross-cultural. People have read them in Asian languages, European languages, and others. I mean, I've even seen an emoji version of um, Alice in Wonderland. And it's a good common framework to visualize and share ideas. Compared to Shakespeare and the Bible, Carol stories are only a couple of hundred pages long. Um, therefore, they've got a higher density of ideas per page. And in my opinion, they're more fun. The original illustrations are great. Um, and you know, I like to compare. Oops, I like to compare the croquet game to the modern corporate away day, where you make sure that the boss wins. The Hatter's Tea Party represents many of the committee meetings I have attended. You know, this form of humour we can see in Dilbert. You know, it's resurrected there in its own way. The same sort of humour. And in Germany, there's a series of books. Um, got the Gunter principle, and they're used for, in this case, sales. You know, and for business. And they're a really entertaining way of getting serious points across, you know, to an audience. Um, and I regard it as a cross-cultural Bible for dysfunctional behavior, you know, in organizations that people can really see very quickly. Mark Twain is a, a, a different character. They're around at the same time, but he's extremely quotable because of his broad experience, which I've listed here. Um, and his engaging style. A Connecticut Yankee um, in the courts of King Arthur, um, which isn't his most famous book, but it provides me with lots of business examples wrapped up in a funny story. You know, it's a time travel story like Back to the Future. So Hank Morgan, who works on an assembly line at the end of the 19th century, 
is hit on the head during an industrial dispute, and he wakes up in the sixth century England outside the court of King Arthur. So he meets all the characters that we're familiar with, including King Arthur, Lancelot, and Merlin. And Hank figures with his modern know-how, he will become top of the heap within three weeks with his 1300 year advantage over the rest of the world. He becomes a knight of the round table called Sir Boss. He's a modernizer and the knights are soon cycling around the kingdom with branding on their shields to promote products such as toothpaste. Um, he introduces electricity, telegraphs and guns into sixth century. He's regarded as a magician and his rivalry with Merlin causes friction in court as the old technology does battle with the new. And they're both regarded as magic. And it's the same way today when people are talking about AI and machine learning with such awe. You know, Hank is a prototype of the thrusty executive and agenda, doing it for the greater good without any idea of the consequences. The story is told from Hank's perspective and Twain mocks the unshakable self-belief, you know, of Hank, which is quite similar to some of the tech titans and politicians we have today who simply know what's best for us. You know, one irony is that when he returns to the 19th century, he yearns for the simplicity of Camelot. But when he's in Camelot, he complains about how backward it is and how unhygienic everything is. Carol himself- Four minutes, Stephen. Okay, uh, don't worry, I'll make it. Um, Carol has, um, Comparisons with Larry Page, he's one of the founders of Google. He has an arts background, studied music composition, and, and while at university, he created an inkjet printer made of Lego bricks. Before Google, he had the plan to make a music synthesizer by creating some software. You know, Twain, on the other hand, was, as we said, reporter, steamboat navigator, gold prospector, and even invented an early typesetting machine that didn't come off. So he's an inventor. You know, but he's a model for leaders who collect real life experience you know, and use it to develop their philosophy rather than selecting their values and maintaining them when their circumstances change. As Groucho, as Groucho Marx said, you know, these are my principles. If you don't like them, well, I have others. Um, the question is, do we want our leaders to have a sense of humor? And I distinguish between being likable, which many leaders do try and do, and being funny, which most fail at. They're two different things. And in this sort of graphic based on personal observation and just intended to provoke some thoughts, I think that the leaders who have tended to demonstrate humor rather than feeling our pain um, are better performers and end up being better well-liked and doing better for us. You know, going on a talk show doesn't make you funny, but shows that you want to be likable. Um, taking a chat show format and subverting it, like Barry Humphreys does, um, shows how you can still be funny at 80 years old. So, and these are the reasons why they should do them. Self-awareness, generating understanding, producing engagement, building trust with the teams and testing the reality constantly. Um, you know, in my, in my conclusion, you know, I'd say that the comedian Mel Brooks directed, if anyone doesn't know about Mel Brooks, he, he directed Blazing Saddles, he wrote The Producers, both fantastic films that anyone would be proud to do. And he also produced, few people know, The Elephant Man and The Fly. Uh, and this was after a long career in radio and television. And he believed that one of his greatest skills was producing a good mood on sets so that people wanted to work with him. So it doesn't sound like much, but for example, he lost the main actor to illness for Blazing Saddles on the first day of shooting. And he rang someone up to start the following three days later on the Monday. <clears throat> so using humor in teams isn't a soft skill. It actually has hard economic benefits. And as Shakespeare's Julius Caesar said, you know, let me, as I quote here, you know, let me have men around me that are fat. And I would replace fat with funny um, because it helps everyone to perform and it makes the day go faster. Um, it's not the secret ingredient in being a leader but it provides a seasoning that will bring out the flavor of the combined talents um, of the team. You know, a leader will need to tap into that humor. And as a colleague, it will help you to help others as well as be better prepared to adapt to the challenges of the future. Carol and Twain are just two of the people who can support you. Thank you.
Thanks so much, Stephen, for that uh, very uh, convincing presentation. Uh, I was a little wondering, <laughs> oh, how are you going to make these connections? And I think you made them quite persuasively, but we'll leave that um, for more discussion after our uh, next paper. So, Lily, I'll ask you now if you could please uh, share your screen. And I apologize in advance for the pronunciation of your university that I'm going to try and uh, get off here. So just, I'll just wait for it to pop up. Yeah, I can see the slides now. So Lily Zach is a senior lecturer in the Department of English Studies, Jodvoschlorand University, Budapest, Hungary. She completed her PhD at the National University of Ireland, Galway in 2016, focusing on the formulation of Irish national identity and Irish perceptions of Central Europe in the 20th century. Her research interests lie in the field of transnational hu history, humor studies and food history, focusing on the interconnectedness of the human past and the complexity of identities across the English speaking world. She is currently engaged in researching the significance of humour in totalitarian societies within a transnational framework. The title of Lily's paper today is The Significance of Dictator Jokes in Communist Hungary Within the Context of Individuals' Right to Freedom of Opinion. Lily, whenever you're ready. That's great. Thank you so much for the introduction, Rodney. And I would like to start by apologizing that I have to switch my camera off because apparently my internet cannot handle the conference. So I'm sure that's a great sign, but just to make everything a little bit smoother, I'm, I'm switching off my camera, but I hope that at least the slides are visible and that you can hear me okay. So let's get started. As you can see uh, from the title of my presentation, my topic and my approach is slightly different than the previous talks in this panel as I am taking more of a historical approach and this is a, a historical topic and so let's get started. Today I'm going to explore the value of humor under oppression and provide insights into the power and limitation of political jokes about the leaders of communist Hungary between 1948 and 1963. By analyzing jokes targeting the Stalinist Matyas Rakoci and uh, after him Janos Kadar, I'm going to highlight the main functions of dictator jokes in the face of atrocities, emphasizing the significance of humor as a universal expression of individuals' freedom of opinion. After presenting a brief historical context about Hungary in this period, I'm going to talk a couple of words about my source material and the joke collections I used. Then I will move on to the main subject of totalitarian humor in Hungary, comparing jokes about Stalin and the Hungarian communist leaders Rakoci and Kadar. So let's get started with the historical context here. Now, given that Hungary was on the losing side in the Second World War and it was quote unquote liberated by the Soviet Union, as in invaded uh, in April 1945, it could be said without exaggeration that the country was, was not off uh, for a great start. Thanks to the propaganda machinery and the salami tactics of eliminating all external and internal real and imagined enemies, the communists managed, the communists managed to grab and consolidate their power after a brief coalition period between 1945 and 1948. Under their leadership of Matyas Rakuchi, whom we can see on the upper corner, uh, Stalin's best disciple, in his own words, the Hungarian Working People's Party, or the MDP, established totalitarian rule in Hungary with Stalin-inspired political purges, arrests, internments, executions, and deportations. Even though Stalin's death in 1953 also had its impact on Hungarian politics, similarly to the 20th Congress of the Soviet Communist Party in February 1956, that's the event that was associated with uh, Khrushchev's uh, attempt at the Stalinization, the revolution in Hungary with demands for political reform and democracy did not break out in Hungary until October 1956. 
when Janusz Kadar came to power with Soviet military aid in early November 1956, the new regime was isolated. Therefore, Kadar's primary aim was to consolidate the power of the new Hungarian revolutionary working uh, worker peasant government and the Hungarian Socialist Workers Party, the MSNP. So we can see there's a shift between the, um, the two ruling parties. So MDP under Rakoci and MSNP under Kadar. Nevertheless, despite Kadar's initial promises, internment camps were reopened, large scale violence, tortures, mass killings were unleashed. Martial law was declared in December 1956, followed by the establishment of People's Courts in the spring of 1957, leading to mass scale arrests, imprisonments, and executions. Kadar's need to overcome the political and psychological burden of the bloody suppression of the revolution eventually became a cornerstone of the new regime, which is why Kadarist Hungary came to be seen later as the jolliest barrack of the Eastern Bloc after the mid 1960s. The general amnesty on uh, the 22nd of March in 1963, uh, which released political prisoners put an end to political triers. So this amnesty in 63 was a major milestone. Uh, however, today we're focusing on the period of retaliations up until that point. Now moving on to totalitarian jokes. In order to assess the significance of dictator jokes in communist Hungary, I analyzed the following uh, joke collections. Those uh, by ethnographer Imra Kotona, uh, those are manuscript collections as well, so the widest range of materials. And in addition to that, uh, also the materials uh, collected by writer and historian George Dalos, historian Jan Oshoma, and journalists Jozef Benye and Imra Senesh. Furthermore, besides jokes, anecdotes and pamphlets were also of key importance as they revealed the complexity of humor in revolutionary Hungary during the darkest period of Kadarist retaliations. Crucially, jokes and pamphlets reflected popular humor from below, and while state-sanctioned humor also existed in this period as an, import, as an important propaganda tool, their assessment is beyond today's paper. As a Stalinist system, fear was a central element between 1948 and 63. Therefore, jokes, which mo most commonly uh, featured Dallas humor, they were a means of processing the random acts of terror that featured heavily in the totalitarian state and uh, to function as a way for every, they functioned as a way for everyday people to express their thoughts and opinions in a modified manner since their actual freedom of expression was almost completely limited. We can establish that popular humor under Rakuchi was comparable to that of Russia as it followed Stalinist patterns. Therefore, in addition to targeting Hungarian politicians, popular jokes in Hungary also very heavily featured Stalin in this period. These jokes rarely included economical, social or cultural questions and completely left out sports and arts, uh, as well as Stalin's private life. However, they focused on the following topics in descending order. The question of blind faith, Stalin's cult, his personality cult, uh, terror and leadership, the halt of socioeconomic progress, what, um, comments on Stalin's looks, so we can expect some mustache centered humor there, and puns about Stalin's name. Naturally, there was an overlap among jokes as they could fell under multiple categories. They kept reappearing even after Stalin's death which demonstrated the topicality of certain issues, such as fearing the return of Stalinist terror and the possible consequences of this. Kotona stressed uh, that the large uh, number of Freudian slips and jokes about the death of the dictator revealed the relief that the population felt upon the occasion. Consequently, posthumous Stalin jokes had a very busy afterlife. Most of them had focused on the personality cult and the places or events associated with them and the, cons and the consequences of the de-Stalinization process. For example, uh, Stalin's removal from the Lenin Mausoleum in uh, 1961, 
was a very frequently recurring theme, or the Stalin monument in Budapest that was demolished during the, during the days of the 1956 revolution. So that is what we can see on this uh, pamphlet as well, that, um, that uh, Stalin statue and the connection between Stalin and Rakoci. Uh, that uh, that this one um, uh, pr um, projects there. Now moving on to Rakoci jokes. While Kotona reported that a number of Stalin and Rakoci jokes collected was uh, about the same, the, there sorry there still was a very stark contrast between them. Namely, first of all, that Stalin jokes came back to life in 1951 and 1961, as I just mentioned, while Rakoci almost completely disappeared into obscurity. Another difference was that, secondly, while the majority of Stalinist jokes mocked the absurdity of the leader cult, the anecdotes and wisecracks about Rakoci mostly ridiculed his physical appearance. appearance. Furthermore, third point here, many popular Rakuchi jokes were not specific to him, but were simply recycled dictator jokes. These were the variants of Adolf Hitler, Stalin, uh, Romanian dictator Nicolae Ceausescu, or Chinese leader Mao Zedong. More specifically, most of Rakuchi's personality cult jokes did not come into existence during this period of 48 and 56, but had either existed before as joke stereotypes, and were then simply tailored to the needs of the circumstances of the Rakuchi era, or they came into existence later as a form of vindication for everyday citizens. As for the main characteristics or the main themes that were concerned, uh, uh, in addition to the high number of puns, the main characteristics of these jokes were, uh, oh, sorry, the first one, obsession uh, with Rakuchi's looks and negative traits, wishing for his death or departure or both, criticizing the personality cults, blaming Rakuchi for poverty, rationing and the terror in the country, portraying him as a mere lackey, labeling his politics as a hopeless cul-de-sac or just generally condemning him. It is noteworthy that Rakuchi jokes were unmistakably negative in their tone and often crude in their wording and language. So very often up the quite obscene uh, because they were meant to release frustration, anger, and even hatred and to function as verbal painkillers to ease confrontation with everyday hardships. Rakuchi jokes were not primarily meant to work as a means of resistance, but of frustration and disdain that fostered social adjustment to the changing political environment. Therefore, the coping function of laughter, uh, uh, this is the terminology used by John Morrell in relation to the Holocaust. So the critical function according to Morrell is the resistance function. And in addition to that, he mentions coping uh, as in the psychological letting of steam, like the valve function uh, or the cohesive function to build a uh, social bond. So here the coping function of laughter um, is assessed uh, in addition to the critical and cohesive potential of humor. Now, uh, this is how humor helped victims or the oppressed through suffering as it assisted them to sustain morale and served as an alternative means for everyday citizens to express their opinion, which as I said, was not possible otherwise. Making sense of the absurdity of violence in order to cope with everyday life in the system was where gallows humor and dark satire thrived. This is why Rakuchi jokes that featured different scenarios for his death stood out since they were essentially manifestations for a somewhat unconventional kind of wishful thinking. A couple of them uh, that involve silly puns as part of the general premise that Rakuchi should be hanged utilized incongruity extremely efficiently, given the contrast between the childishness of a silly pun and the violent outcome of the desired act. Due to the limited number of written sources from the days of the revolution, humorous and often handwritten pamphlets had a peculiar significance. They contained revolutionary demands, notices, as well as aims and objectives, often executed in a humorous manner, even when it came to discussing violence. 
The voices in these pamphlets and jokes had a limited chance to be heard elsewhere or by other means. Therefore, they're crucial in order to appreciate the complexity of revolutionary changes. Um, other forms of humorous criticism included mock versions of uh, parodies, children's rhymes, poems, prayers, which is uh, a prayer is what we can see on the right hand side. I'm going to uh, give you a presentation uh, in a minute. Uh, so prayers, proverbs, ad classifieds, eulogies, as well as fake letters, fake school report cards and graffiti. By relying on satire and mockery, often featuring puns as literary devices, these primarily criticized the damage that Rakoshi and his regime had done with their distorted economic policy, political decisions, and violent secret police. Uh, one of the most striking uses of dark humor may be illustrated by uh, this prayer parody, that is the variation of the Lord's Prayer, and it was created uh, in the days after the Soviet invasion. So uh, even though there is no exact date in the archives, the estimation is for between the 8th and 15th of November 1956. Our father Khrushchev, who art in the Kremlin, cursed be thy name, in Moscow as it is in Budapest. Do not take away our daily bread and release our prisoners as we release your troops who have invaded us. And do not lead us to Siberia, but deliver us from the, from the Russians. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, but not forever and ever. Amen. So we can see that uh, uh, the uh, the different functions of humor that I had, had mentioned before, they work very well uh, in this format as well. So the creators of these jokes and these humorous pamphlets, etc., they uh, utilize and they combine the tragedy and the violence uh, and the re violence of the reality of the situation with a with very creative kind of um, absurdist and um, satirical and deeply satirical methods. Now Five moving on minutes. to sorry, Lily. Perfect. Uh, moving on to Kadar, uh, our last section here. Kadar started to feature in these materials, of course, um, in early November, as he managed to crush the revolution with the help of the Soviet military uh, after the 4th of November. Noticeably, a shift occurred in the tone of pamphlets after the Soviet invasion with self-irony, bitter mockery, sarcasm and gallows humor becoming even more prominent. Guns, violence, and destruction came to dominate pamphlets and jokes in late 1956. By fulfilling the trio uh, of functions that I had mentioned before, critical, cohesive, and coping functions of humor all at once, these puns, mock articles, and announcements all targeted the nonsense and the absurdity of the Soviet invasion and the subsequent counter-propaganda that was issued by Kadat. This form of mockery served not only a means of resistance, but also had a therapeutic function uh, to process the frustration and the trauma that resu resulted from the invasion. Uh, Cod, uh, sorry, Cotton's manuscripts reveal that the main themes during this period were uh, Rakushi. So uh, amongst the dictators, the Rakushi jokes featured still in the highest number. After that, the general uh, revolution related topics such as the October fight, ruins, youngsters, as in how young the revolutionaries were, Russian in invention, intervention, fear, Stalin, and at the bottom of the list, Kada. These themes heavily overlapped with those of many revolutionary pamphlets, among other themes, uh, like mockery of Rakoshi and Kada are still prominent and particularly the incompetence and the lack of legitimacy of Kadar um, that was very, very heavily illustrated. Uh, so uh, I have an example here. There is a joke or like rather a riddle that illustrates this uh, attitude towards Kadar. Why are there only five members in the Kadar government? Because they couldn't fit more people in the tank. So that uh, shows us again, like uh, the legitimacy and father's association with the uh, brutal force of the Soviet army. That was very much uh, one question. They belong together. 
Interestingly, uh, it appears that the number of jokes uh, was limited in the immediate aftermath of the revolution, uh, since even dictators had to earn their jokes, and Kadar was seen as such an insignificant and despised figure, but it was only around March or April 1957 that graffiti, for example, started to appear mocking him. Curiously, uh, oh yeah, that's the last one. Curiously, with the exception of 1957, Khrushchev jokes outnumbered Kadar jokes every year, which illustrated the difference between the image of Rakushi and that of Kadar in popular discourse. Notably, Katona did not create a separate section for Kadar jokes in any of his anthologies. However, his manuscript collection actually has a a log for Kadar jokes and uh, in a yearly breakdown, also noting the number of variant jokes. Uh, the, um, for example, the years between, 50, so between 56 and 63, these years were dominated by jokes that mocked Kadar as a fool simply because he was seen as a useless lackey of approach job. So we're going to see um, quite a big difference in terms of like how these themes changed after 63, but um, not today. And uh, what you can see on the screen here is uh, like taken from a pamphlet, which in translation um, sounds like long live Janusz Kadar, who has created the unity of the nation against himself. So that again is uh, it's quite, uh, quite a good illustration to people's attitudes towards uh, Kadar in this period. Now, having assessed a wide range of jokes and pamphlets from the days of the 1956 revolution and the years of Kadarist retaliations, I aim to demonstrate the complexity of humor and dictator jokes in particular. In contrast to revolutionary days, which were dominated by the critical uses of humor as a means of popular resistance, so these were the so-called opposition jokes, the period before the general amnesty of 63 were traditionally associated with fear, terror, arrest, and executions. Despite this repressive environment, political jokes appeared to be ruthless and had no mercy for any individual, institution, or power, dictators included. In fact, the greater the oppression, the more ruthless the jokes ended up. Indeed, the jokes and pamphlets of the period between 56 and 59 demonstrated this, particularly in the way that they addressed the presence of violence and the absurdity of state-sanctioned propaganda. Similarly, the humiliated and mentally broken victims of the communist regime's political and cultural terror simply wanted to laugh at their oppressors, and this is what gave birth to many dictator jokes. These served as a coping mechanism for the collective trauma caused by the Soviet invasion, in addition to their potential to act as a social cohesive force within communities. Ultimately, the anonymity of jokes allowed for the oppressed to express their thoughts about the system and its leaders, which was otherwise not possible in a totalitarian society. And while tracing the changes associated with the establishment of Kadar's so-called welfare dictatorship is beyond the scope of this paper, uh, changes in the functions of humor remained noteworthy under the years of consolidation that followed from the mid-60s. Imp uh, most importantly, the growing significance of state-sanctioned laughter has to be stressed when describing the period after 1963. That, however, is a topic for another time. So I leave you with that. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Lily, for a, another wonderful paper. I am in, I'm uh, forever indebted for you for increasing my knowledge on this topic by 100%. And it looks like you have a really thrilling archive uh, to be uh, interacting with uh, there. We already have a hand up. Uh, uh, Jackie, I'll pass over to you. If uh, anyone wants to put another question in the chat or wait, we've got a bit under 10 minutes uh, for questions. Uh, let's go ahead. But Jackie, please. Uh, you're on mute, Jackie. Screen's off, but I think you're unmuted now. Can you hear me now? Jackie, you can hear, yeah. Yeah, my apologies. And I'll leave my video off because um, so this is primarily for, for Lily. I found that fascinating. Thank you, Lily, because I'm researching 
Um, and currently in Cuba. So that's why I've got my camera off because it's just kind of uh, the, the signal is not great. But it's really interesting because you mentioned some countries pre-1956 that um, were the butt of, of jokes. Um, you said China and, and uh, I know you mentioned um, a couple of other neighbors. And you didn't mention Cuba, and I wonder if you had um, ever come across any any jokes about that. Although pre nineteen fifty six, you wouldn't do because of the revolution in Cuba didn't happen until nineteen fifty nine. But um, one thing I've noticed in Cuba is they're very focused on um, a lot of the humour tends to focus or hit out at people, society itself, rather, rather than at the leaders. And I wondered if in the revolutionary um, aspect of um, in Hungary, if, if, if there was evidence of that, or the, the humour was mostly aimed towards the leaders. If you've got anything to say about that, and Lily, I hope you don't mind, I will be definitely contacting you. That's great. Thank you so much for uh, the question and the comment, Jackie. Now, I am also going to keep my camera off because, well, not because I'm in communist Cuba, but because I'm in contemporary Hungary. So we're technically in the same boat, really, it seems. But um, uh, it's it, it really is a fascinating topic. And like, I wish I could have included more. Like, I kept narrowing and narrowing and narrowing down my paper just to be able to fit in here. But there's definitely a wealth of material even with regards to, of course, uh, Cuba and other socialist or communist countries as well. Now, technically for today, I was focusing on like, this very short period, so between 56 and, uh, and 63, but my wider research project that I'm hoping will end up in a book uh, is much larger and covers the entirety of the communist period in Hungary. So humor in, uh, in Kadaris, Hungary, so up until the 90s. Uh, but I have already come across uh, several, well, both jokes and um, caricatures, you know, or political cartoons about Cuba and uh, particularly the Bay of Pigs. Uh, that's uh, that was a you know a number one um, issue and like the uh, like the missile crisis and everything. So both in terms of like like just focusing on Cuba, but also as part of the wider. Uh, like a geopolitical conflict, so U.S. versus Soviet Union. So it was very, uh, very much. Uh, it, it was very much a popular um, subject. So so far, I have only like seen them and noted. Oh, that's great! I'm going to come back to that. So I haven't processed the material yet. So I'm not able to actually provide any details on that, except for the fact that yes, it was very much uh, a common topic for um, for interest. Yeah, right. Thanks, Lily. Thank you, Jackie. Thanks to both. Mark, you had your hand raised. Thank you, Rodney. And thank you to both Lily and Stephen for really enjoyable papers. Um, two questions. One to Lily. Have you been able to conduct any comparative work on the other regimes near Hungary during the same time? And secondly, to Stephen, the comparisons made in business literature between Carol and Twain on the one hand and the perverse outcomes that happen in companies, and I'm thinking more of corporations here, seem to have a bit of a long history going back to the Peter principle that, that people can be promoted to their level of incompetence. And, and it seems that there's repeated attempts to try and improve corporations, even though they've been since James Burnham's managerial revolution, seen as wonderful things. And during the 1950s, they were celebrated in America as examples of Main Street democracy and had these ordered uh, hierarchical regimes based on the military. And yet, as you, you know better than me, perverse outcomes kept on happening in the search for better corporations, better responsive companies. It seems that 
there's lately an, an embrace to some extent of this perennial problem that happens with companies. If I, if I answer first, I mean, I, I agree with it. I mean, um, I agree because it's, you know, it's been part of the stuff that I do. And I, and I looked through even when I was doing this, you know, things like the Peter Principle and this, but I think that it's not so much the concept of the corporation as a structure, because it's necessary for, um, for feeding and paying people, but it's the behaviors um, internally. You know that um, actually it's not corporation it's probably words like empire you know and, and when i look at companies now and now and i'm and i'm giving it i'm talking to my own people i use the examples you know when people are looking that far back i say you know don't bother to look that far back you know look at microsoft look at google look at amazon you know they're middle-aged now and they're they're way down you know there's probably a, a certain size of company and a certain style of behavior where they kind of collapse under their own weight um, and the idea of using humor a little bit and talking about humor and leadership is that these people and I worked for large companies like MBP and actually I would say that the senior leadership there were quite reflective about their own behavior um, and that makes and that makes the yeah that makes a big difference and if I throw in a kind of other sort of joke when I have that list of leaders one who I have a soft spot for is actually Elon Musk because and, um, two or two examples. One, when he was young, and he's always been into energy and whatever, he wrote a paper called The Importance of Being Solar, okay? And simply for the title alone, because obviously it was a tribute to the, uh, the importance of being earnest, I think that, you know, he gained a few house points with me. And then there's um, an anecdote that when he tried to um, kick off SpaceX, um, he went over to, because he, he was trying to jumpstart it. He wanted to buy a couple of missiles because you can take them. And, and he actually went over to Russia and tried to buy them. And just the idea of him going over and trying to buy a couple of missiles from Russia, it didn't work out in the end. But um, I can see that, you know, I mean, someone who thinks like that um, is adaptable enough. And, he, you know, and even though it doesn't come across like that, you know, through the media, I suspect that all the things that he does, he will listen, adapt, change. So um, I'm, al I'm always interested in, you know, in how these people do it. And the same thing works, it's not just organizations. I think it also works with politics as well. I think that, you know, regardless of whether it's Europe, um, America, you know, or, or elsewhere, we're getting to a stage where they've all been taught the same things, the same lessons, mm -hmm. and there's not enough diversity of thought. And that's what I kind of encourage in the teams, you know, that um, I do. And I use it to provoke, you know, not, not to agree with them, to provoke them and say, you know, why I'm wrong. A sort Sorry, of minor, you... so I was just going to say, a sort of minor permanent revolution. That's, I mean, and that's how we, you know, I mean, and that's why I like the Mark Twain story. I just wish that they'd make it into more, if, you know, if it had been into a film a few years ago, I could imagine Bruce Willis, doing a great job as um, Hank. And there would have been plenty of actors like uh, Richard E. Grant and others, you know, who could have done the, um, the King Arthur bit as well. But um, that kind of, I mean, one of the modern plagues, if you like, is that self, the, um, the experts' um, self-belief, you know, and we've seen it in recent, you know, crises as well. And we see it played out now, you know, in our large, forget about corporations, in our large um, organizations. And obviously I'm living in Germany, but you know, the, the EU is, uh, you know, could do with a little bit of a, a revolution itself. Yeah, I was just gonna say, um, Lily, if you wanna answer Steve, uh, Mark's yeah, question sorry. to you. And sure. Dennis, maybe you can put your question in the chat. I know that you've got a panel to moderate soon as well. Lily, please. Yes, so uh, first of all, uh, like if I'm thinking about the other communist countries or the others in the in the Eastern Bloc, that's definitely, uh, I think, quite an important uh, step to take in research and uh, not just in terms of like comparative studies uh, to, to have a comparative study. Uh, but uh, what I am doing is a is a transnational approach. So it's not necessarily to compare jokes in Hungary versus Czechoslovakia, etc., but to see like how jokes travel from 
characters to see like uh, or to illustrate how humor and jokes were not stopped by borders. So this is, this includes both within the Eastern Bloc and to actually include, and that is something that is part of my research, to include uh, like uh, investigating the role of uh, Radio Free Europe. So to kind of have that kind of uh, like to trace the uh, like how jokes, some of the jokes managed to travel even across the Iron Curtain and uh, like Radio Free Europe and uh, the archives of the Open Society archives here, um, I have found actually were the materials and there was also um, and there was also a like a joke journal or like it's more like a like satirical magazine uh, that uh, that was published uh, in London uh, in the aftermath of the revolution. So this kind of you see like how jokes traveled across borders uh, to illustrate like like how how rich their lives were and how different influences uh, from both sides of the Iron Curtain. Um, how different influences shaped and formulated humor like that is definitely part of like what I'm doing but as I said it's a slow slow process however if I want if I can mention like a couple of studies so like one of the it's not really like that academic but uh, Ben Lewis's Hammer and Tickle uh, in that book uh, he includes several chapters on the Eastern Bloc in general so there's already like different materials and uh, what I mentioned about different jokes being recycled across the region. That is something that is very visible already from Ben Lewis's book. Uh, so, uh, so this is definitely something that I think should be included. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't think that a merely Hungarian project is enough to do the topic justice. There's definitely need for both a, a focus and focus on the Eastern Bloc as well as uh, transnational connections uh, to, to illustrate the complexity of the question. So thanks. Wonderful. Thanks so much for that fulsome answer, Lily. And let's thank all of our presenters, uh, Lily, Stephen, and Izu at the top for their fantastic presentations today. Uh, Dennis, I don't know if you wanted to put your question in. I can leave this open. I won't close the room. But if others want to go, and particularly if you're in my time zone, quickly, you know, smash a gin and tonic or something before the next um, presentation to keep you going, uh, I'll see you there. So I'll keep the room open um, for Dennis. Uh, or you can. Yeah. Move. All right. All right. I'll, I'll post my question quickly. Um, okay. All right. We... Everyone else, I'll um, see you in 10 minutes. Thanks, Rodney. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, the next, uh, I think I think I'll write it in the chat. If the next uh, the next is already in ten minutes, so um, <laughs> I'll write my question. Uh, I'll write my question to you, Lily. It was for you, but uh, thank you to all of you for very That's interesting. Great. Thank interesting. you so much. I'll be I'll be keeping an eye out for that. Thanks. <laughs> all right. Cheers, See you everyone. all soon, everyone. Thank you.